Awesome. So uh, once again, if everyone can mute yourself um, while our presenters are speaking, we'll greatly appreciate that. Uh, my name is Jose Pelayo. I am the Director of Workforce Development, and today we are presenting a very important webinar in preparing today's future, uh, preparing for today and tomorrow's uh, jobs, uh, a workshop on fu uh, future workforce trends, but the importance of actually uh, the credit. Uh, so I want to actually give a big thank you uh, before we begin to our partner, Annabelle at City as well as Cedilla, uh, for being our guest speaker. Uh, thank you to them for being able to allow us to host this uh, webinar. Uh, with that being said, we'll wait for Alicia to bring up the PowerPoint presentation. But in the meantime, um, a little bit about Los Angeles County Economic Development Corporation. Uh, we are LAEDC. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization uh, working across the LA region, across all 88 cities, uh, over 100 unincorporated areas in the LA area. Um, and we actually host different series of webinars such as this. We will be hosting another one. Um, but with that being said, before we jump in, we'd like to do a very quick exercise um, on the importance of the LA economy and how that relates to credit. So I'll segue it to my colleague, Alicia, and allow her to introduce herself. Jose, hi everybody. My name is Alicia Main. I work for the Los Angeles County Economic Development Corporation as Assistant Program Manager. So thank you so much for being here. Before I start, I kind of wanted to ask anybody and kind of gauge everybody's experience of like, this question, how much money do you need to be able to live in Los Angeles County? And think about all the different things that might go into it, whether that's rent, food, transportation. Um, would love to hear everybody's guesses. If you could write it in the chat, we'd love to see that as well. So how much money do you think you need to be able to live in Los Angeles County? If you want to put it in the chat, and I, I urge everyone to participate, um, you can put our hourly rate. So you do you think you need to be making $15 an hour to barely live in LA County and survive 20, um, 25? What do you guys think? So if you can put that in the chat, um, and then we'll read some answers and then move on to the next um, question, just to kind of get a glance. Okay, so um, you got some answers coming in, Alicia. All right, so we have forty thousand a year, uh, five thousand per month, three thousand, sixty per hour, seventy. Okay, great. So depends on the area. Okay, so these are really great answers. Thank you so much for sharing. So the answer to this is actually, so for one person without anybody else as a dependent, it's around twenty six dollars and. Uh, 63 cents for an hour. So that's an annual salary around 55385 to be able to live uh, within a living wage within Los Angeles County. And so currently, as of July 2024, the minimum wage within Los Angeles County is around $17.27. So we kind of just wanted to get folks engaged and kind of learning about some of the price points of like how much you'd be able to live in Los Angeles County. And so some of the factors we can see are, you know, food, medical, housing, transportations, all the different things that for one adult with no children, that's kind of the annual salary we would need to be able to make. Thank you so much for the engagement. I appreciate that. And then without further ado, I'm going to be also presenting our presenter, who is Sadia Gosla, who is a branch manager here within City Bake. So thank you so much for joining and I'll leave the floor to you. All right. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, LAEDC, for allowing me this opportunity to talk about credit, right? Everybody wants to know about credit. It's that word that people are scared of, but intrigued on. And it's just something we have to deal with every single day. So as, as you all see, my name is Sadia Gosla. I'm a branch manager for Citibank. A little bit about me, I've been in the financial services industry for about 20 years. And so I've dealt with every different type of credit profile that's out there. And so I have so many answers for you. Some I might not know, which I'll get you the answer for if you need that. So let's go ahead and get started. Next, Alicia. Thank you. So what we're going to talk about today is credit reports and scores. Now, who knows what a credit report is and what really goes into a credit score? 
And if you guys want to just do some reactions in the chat, that'll be great. And if you have any questions, we'll wait till the end. Okay, guys. So credit reports are something that we all have to deal with. And we'll learn a little bit more about that. So some of us know that, hey, what's a credit report? It's something that gets recorded, reported on a daily basis. And usually credit reports and scores are there for seven years. So if any of you have your participant guide, we can kind of talk about that. But one thing I wanna mention is your credit history can affect your access to anything, whether that's getting a loan in the future, whether that's finding a job, finding, getting insurance quotes, as well as even some people that need a loan won't be able to get it if they don't have a strong credit score. Now, next page, Alicia. All right, and then next page again. Okay, so one thing that I do wanna remind everybody, especially in today's day and age, you really wanna know what is in your credit report. And the reason why this is so important for you is because there, your credit is your is your is is so close to you, right? This is something that ultimately defines you in the U.S. Your credit can either make or break you, and we'll go a little bit more about that in in our next few slides. So next, Alicia. All right. So here's a question: How many people can name? A few things that are on this list that are not included in your credit report. Go ahead and use that chat box so we can get some answers out there. Good, thank you. Somebody said traffic tickets and fines. Yep, that is not on your credit report. You are right. That's on your driving record, but not your credit report. And okay, somebody said three as well. There's a few things there. Arrests and convictions, that is also correct. That is not on your credit report. Correct, your savings account balance, that is not on your credit report. In your cell phone payment plan, that is not on your credit report as well as debit card purchases. So good job on that. So everything else you see on here will be on your credit report. So any names that you may have, you might have had a married name or an alias or another type of name where it's like an abbreviated version of your name, that is all included on your credit report. Surprisingly enough, even your ages, your date of birth is also on your credit report. Um, all your payment history for your credit cards, that is on your credit report. Surprisingly enough, even bankruptcies can stay on your credit card, on your credit report for about 10 years. Some fall off in seven and then some fall off in 10. Your also student loan payments. Are you making your student loan payments on time? It's extremely important. And credit limits, right? Anytime you get a new credit card or a credit limit increase or a decrease for that matter, that is all reported to your credit credit report. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever dealt with this in the past, but I know when I was, you know, at the age of 18, not too long ago, I had, you know, every retailer out there asking me for, hey, do you want to apply for a credit card? Hey, do you want to apply for a credit card? And, you know, when I was younger, I would say yes to it all because I didn't realize that credit you have to actually pay back. So I always want to remind you guys that always think before you say yes to accepting and applying for a credit card because it does need to be paid wow. back. And keep in mind, your payment history does stay on your credit report for seven years. So next slide, Alicia. Okay, so a few things that are included on your credit report, your identifying information. So what's that? I know we kind of briefly talked about on the previous slide, your name, any addresses that you've lived at will also show up on your credit report. Some debts and some bills will also show on your credit report. And public record information. Now you might ask, what is that, right? 
Public record information is anything that is recorded at the county clerk's office. For example, if let's say you owe anything in child support, back, back child support, that's going to be public record. Also, if you get married, that's public record. Things of that nature are all in your credit report. Um, also, anytime you apply for credit, that will show up on your credit report. And so let's say you go and you apply for five credit cards in the same day. All five credit inquiries will show up on your credit report. And keep in mind, you don't want to have too many inquiries within a short period of time because this will actually decrease your credit score. So it's always a good thing to remember, hey, do I really need this credit credit product before I go ahead and apply? So go next slide, Alicia. And let's see. So Okay, for all of you that don't know, the three main credit reporting agencies are Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. Now, I do want to say something about that. Not every credit card or credit product that you apply for will report to all these agencies. And when you get when you apply for credit, your credit will be pulled from one of these three credit reporting agencies. So if you haven't heard about them, I would highly recommend go ahead and just go to equifax.com, experian.com, transunion.com, just to kind of learn a little bit about what they are and what they do and how this will impact your credit. So next, Alicia. Okay, so we already touched on this a little bit. So as you see in this image, you see this person with a credit score of 720. Now here's a question to the group. Do you think 720 is an exceptional credit score? No, so exactly, thank you. So 720 in the credit scoring um, method will actually be a good credit score. It's not going to be an exceptional credit score. An exceptional credit score will usually be 800 plus. And credit scores range from 350, which is poor, all the way to 850, which is exceptional. And this is a number based on different things that are applied to your credit report. And your credit score pretty much says, hey, this, this, the likelihood of this consumer paying back the debts as agreed are based on your credit score. They look at your prior history and they either extend credit to you or decline credit to you based on your credit score. And one more thing, people with higher credit scores are likely to present lower risk to creditors. And the reason why is because if your credit score is high, lenders are looking at you and creditors are looking at you as though, okay, this person has a good track record. Let's go ahead and lend to them. And that could be anything from a home loan to a unsecured personal loan, to a car loan, or to a credit card, amongst many other things. And for, for those of you who want to be an entrepreneur in the future, this can also impact you with any sort of business financing or business lending needs that you may have for the future. So if you're thinking, hey, I want to get a small business started in a few years, and I'm going to need some working capital. Well, I want to tell you, you want to make sure that you're on top of your credit, because if you don't have strong credit, lenders are less likely to lend to you. Okay, next, Alicia. Thank you. Okay, who uses credit reports and scores? All of these on the page, they use your credit report and your score to do a few things. So for employers, they're gonna some jobs you need to have good credit in order to get hired. For example, if any of you want to work at a financial institution, you have to have good credit. 
Because at the end of the day, when you work at a financial institution, you're giving people advice on finances and their own credit. So they want to make sure that, hey, this person has a good track record on their own personal finances, so they'll be able to further educate others in their financial needs. Also landlords, right? If you're a landlord, you want to make sure that you're going to to rent your place to somebody who can also, who has a good track record of paying back and who is making payments on time. Cell phone companies as well. The reason why is because they want to make sure that they get paid, right? And in some, some states, insurance companies as well. And for the same reason, they just want to make sure that, hey, this person has a good, strong track record with making payments on times. And then some state agencies or affiliated organizations, they want to make sure that you have good credit. For example, if you choose to do anything where you're going to be selling securities or investments, they want to make sure that you have a good, strong credit score. So next. Okay. So as we kind of mentioned before, lenders will set interest rates and terms based on the risks. Now you might ask, what is a risk, right? Or what does a risk look like? So typically the way lenders predict what your interest rate will be on different lending products will be based on how strong or how poor your credit will be, or your credit score is. So with that being said, it's always, it's also a number that's constantly changing. So your credit score can change based on many different things. And have you opened a new credit card in the, in the recent month? Have you made a late payment? Have you applied for too many things at the same time? So all of these things do play into your credit score. And for those of you that are looking to purchase a house in the near future, you you want to have great credit so you get the best interest rate. And as we know, to live in in LA County, we do need to make that minimum of I think it was around fifty five thousand for a one person household. So if you were making that fifty five thousand for a one person household and you have poor credit, chances are you will not qualify for any sort of loan that is not a secured loan. And a secured loan are things that are secured. What does that mean? Your home, right? That's something, if you get a mortgage loan, it's the home that you're going to be living with is the security. So if you don't make your mortgage payment, the banks can ultimately come in and put a lease on your property. Also a car loan that's known as a secured loan because it's secured by your home, by your car. So next, Alicia. Okay, so for some of you, and I, I've dealt with this a lot with um, some of the consumers I've been dealing with in my in my day-to-day -day job. So some are credit invisible. And if you're credit invisible, what that means is you don't have credit report or scores. You, you've either haven't built up your credit, you haven't applied for credit. Those are the reasons you would be credit invincible. And it's extremely important to have some sort of credit so you can build that payment history. So for the future, when you do want to get a home, when you do want to buy a boat, when you do want to, let's say you want to purchase an apartment building, all these things require good credit. Now, sometimes if you don't have credit or you don't have a good credit history, you won't even be able to turn on your utilities like water, gas, and electricity without putting down a large deposit. And the reason why they do that is because they want to ensure that, hey, yes, we don't have history of, on this person and how they make payments, so we're going to charge them a really large deposit in case they default. Then we can have the, then we could take it from that deposit ultimately if you don't make your payment on time. And you also may have a tough time finding a job if you don't have good credit or you don't have any credit for that matter. Okay, On and next, release. thank you. For those of you who don't know, you can always opt out of receiving pre-screened offers of credit or insurance. 
So I know myself, I constantly have pre-screened offers sent to me by either mail, email, and sometimes they even call me to let me know. So if these if these notices get to be too much, you can always opt out of pre-screened offers. And you can also still get offers based on lists from other sources. And some of these or other sources might be, hey, you know, if you bank with a certain institution, you could be on their list to be sent offers. So that, or you can just look for a manual offer. And a lot of times all you have to do is log into your mobile app, click on the offer button, and you'll see different credit offers that might be available to you at that time. And keep in mind, if you do opt out or opt in, that's not a permanent thing. You can reverse the decision in a matter of a click of a button, okay? But one thing I do want to remind you is you cannot opt out of having a credit report. So once you have a credit, once you have a credit product out there, it will be reported to your credit report. Next. Thank you. So just a reminder, right? I know kind of we talk, talked about this a lot, but I want to remind everybody, your credit history can impact you for, for the rest of your life, ultimately, because it follows you, right? Your credit history follows with you until you pass. So you wanna make sure that anytime you're making a payment, you're making a payment on time, you're making the best payment that you can. And a few factors that do go into your credit report are things like how, how early do you pay? How much do you pay? What's your debt to income ratio? And what does that mean? Debt to income ratio is how much money you have coming in versus how much money you have going out. That's the easiest way to think of debt to income ratio. So let's say, you know, you have you have eighty thousand dollars coming in, but of that eighty thousand, you're you know you have twenty thousand going out, right? So your debt ratio would ultimately be twenty five percent, okay? And so you would just take your debt and you would you would divide it by your um, annual income, and that's how you would get your debt to income ratio. But knowing what's in your credit, knowing how to protect your credit is extremely important. I do want to remind everybody, you know, it's always okay. You are allowed one free credit report a year from each of the credit reporting agencies. So make sure you take advantage of that. And the reason why I mention that is because nowadays fraud is so rampant, right, with the uh, with the modern technology that we have with how convenient everything has become so with that comes a little bit of you know the fraud aspect so it's always good to make sure that you're checking your credit and a good rule of thumb is if you do have a bank that you bank with almost every financial institution now has an option where you can check your credit score on the mobile app or if you go into your own bank, they'll kind of show you and navigate how to check your credit from your phone. So that's always a good, good key thing to remember, guys. Next. And then pass one more, Alicia. Thank you. Okay. So how do you improve and manage your credit score? Well, a few things would be make sure to pay your bills on time. And a lot of times if you have a credit card, for those of you who have a credit card, you know that on your credit card statement, you will see your total balance due as well as your minimum payment due. So now, as long as you're paying your minimum payment due, on your credit cards, that will not impact your credit score negatively. It'll show that you are making payments on time. Now, if you're only making the minimum payment due for your credit cards, there's going to be a balance that you carry every month. And what that means is unless you have you have an introductory rate of 0%, any money that you do not pay at the end of your billing cycle, you will be paying interest on interest. So for example, if let's say you have a credit card and you owe $4,000 for this billing cycle and you only make a minimum payment of $100, 
the remainder, the $3,900, will be taxed, not by the government, but you will be paying interest to your credit card company. And keep in mind, the way credit card companies work is as long as you're carrying a balance month over month, you are going to be paying interest on interest. And what's the interest rate on credit cards? That can be anywhere from about, you know, let's say 7% to about 29, 30%. So it can get really high. And especially if you're not great paying it off every month, you're paying interest on interest on interest until you have that balance paid. So it's extremely important to pay your bills on time and as agreed. A good way to do that is use modern technology, right? Use, use that option where you can schedule automatic payments. Another option is you can set a reminder in your phone or in your Outlook or on your calendar. If you have a manual calendar such as myself, you can just write it on there or make a note that says, hey, you know, XYZ credit card payment due on this day or your mortgage. Hey, don't forget you have to pay your mortgage on this time or your rent. So you always want to make sure that all these items are paid in a timely manner. Next, Alicia. Thank you. So the basics of credit scoring. So ultimately, if you have a higher number, and remember we were talking it's 350 to 850. If you have a higher number, that means that to a lender, you have a better credit history. And the likelihood of getting approved if you have a better credit score are higher than if you have a lower credit score or a poor credit score. So, and we've kind of talked about this, but I want to reiterate on it. Two significant factors that will affect your credit score. Are you paying your debts on time and as agreed, as well as your credit utilization rate? So a general rule of thumb is to only use about 30% of your credit utilization. So try, you know, things happen. We all know things come up. So you just have to make sure that you try not to spend too much because if you max out your credit cards, your score will actually decrease. And a few producers of credit scores you will likely have multiple credit scores. If you haven't noticed, there's a few things called the FICO, the Fair Isaac Corporation. So the FICO score is the one that's most known and most widely used amongst most creditors. And then you have a Vantage score. And the way the Vantage score differs from the FICO score is it takes into account the length of history as well as other factors such as your income with the Vantage score, as well as the history of the credit and what type of credit that is as well. Next, Alicia. Thank you. So as you see here, your payment history counts as the, the most grandest thing that counts towards as a factor towards your FICO model. So your payment history counts as almost one third of how what calculates your score. So with that being said, the other 30% will be amount owed. And that goes back to what we were talking about when we were when I was mentioning that your credit utilization. So how much you owe that does either help or or disrupt, disrupt your credit score. And then a few other things that do factor in, but that aren't as impactful is new credit. How much new credit are you applying for? What type of credit? Do you just have mortgages? Do you just have credit cards? Or do you have a mix of auto loans, credit cards, personal loans, mortgages? All these things can kind of play into that. And then your length of credit history. One thing I do want to remind you all that you always want to maintain a credit card that you have had for the longest time. The reason why is because that credit history will actually help you. The longer you've had a card reported on your credit report, the, the better it is on your credit score and it will help you towards the positive, unless that credit card has a lot of negative history, such as 30, 60, 90, 120 day waits, which 
no matter what type of credit product it is, if you have any of those, it will bring down your credit score. Next. Okay. So if you are turned down for credit, so let's say you go to the store, let's say you go to the bank and you apply for something and you get declined, you have a right to know why you were declined. And you can either request that in writing or by phone. And the creditor will tell you exactly A, what your score was, and B, the reason you were turned down. Well, I would say most commonly what I see in my business is delinquencies. So for the most part, whenever I have people that do get turned down for credit, it's usually because they're not paying their credit card bills on time or they're just not paying. So that will impact you so much and it will stay on your record for seven years. So just remember guys, the lucky number seven is a, a big number. So, and it takes, one thing I will say is once you have hurt your credit by either not making payments or not making late payments or utilizing majority of your credit and going above that 30% utilization, you will get turned down and it'll be really tough, right? It's tough to rebuild your credit once you've impacted your credit negatively. So it's always a good general rule of thumb to start fresh, always try to make your payments on time, make them um, you know, make that reminder, like I told you. And also, I want to remind you one more thing. We also have, every bank has this option where you can actually get an alert of when your payments are due. So keep that in mind, just some re general rule, rule of thumb, just do those things like technology has made keeping on top of your credit much easier. And let's say you go to to, to apply for something and you get declined. And you say, hey, last time I checked, which was just a few months ago, my credit score was 800 and I'm at 400. Typically speaking, if you see a big drop like that, there might be something inaccurate reflected on your credit report. And that can be a lot of times what I was mentioning to you. That could be the fraud that had happened. And I'll share this story with you. A while ago, this happened to me. I went to the store, applied for a credit card, and I got declined and I didn't know why. I had found out that somebody had actually purchased an unsecured loan under my credit report. Now, if I hadn't applied for that credit card and gotten declined, I would have never known because at that time I wasn't that savvy with my credit. And I didn't know that I have that right to view my credit for free every year, once a year and it does not impact my credit. So ever since that lesson learned, I have made sure to always view my credit, whether it's on my mobile app with Citi. If you have a credit card with Citi, you'll be able to just check your credit card, credit report and your FICO score right there. And it actually gives you a history and other banks allow this as well. So make sure that you view, view your credit and you review it to make sure that everything that's reported is accurate. And if you do find something that's inaccurate, you have the right and what I highly recommend is dispute it. And you can either dispute that online on any of the credit bureaus that we were talking about earlier, Equifax, Experian, or TransUnion, or you can write a formal letter by hand. You always want to keep a copy of whatever mailing or correspondence you're sending in so you have that for your records so then you can follow up on it as well and then if if you do need to apply for a home loan in the future and you did have that inaccuracy you can always show the lender hey i'm working on getting this removed it was definitely fraud it wasn't me and they'll take that into consideration so next Okay, so what is a good credit score, right? So a good credit score is 670 to 739. An exceptional credit score is 800 to 850. And poor credit score is 300 to 579. Now, these credit scores are all FICO-based credit scoring, okay? So I do also want to mention... 
If you, let's say, are going and purchasing a new car, if you have a lower credit score, you're going to get a higher interest rate of financing than you would if you were somebody with exceptional credit. So it's always, I can't stress enough how important credit is. And again, like this is credit is king. I know we've, we're so used to the common saying cash is king, but in all honesty, credit is the true king and cash. I can say it can be the queen at this point. <laughs> so next Alicia. Okay. So you can take steps to improve and manage your credit score. So one thing I will remind you is your credit is all in your hands. It's completely up to you. You can either make or bake your credit score. And how would you do that? Making sure to pay your bills on time and make sure to pay, always pay the amount owed or at least the minimum payment if you cannot afford to pay the full balance owed. And keep in mind, most lenders or institutions or other um, utility bill companies, cell phone companies, as long as you keep in touch with them and you tell them, hey, I might, I might be having a tough month this month, but I'm going to pay you more next month. They'll work on having a credit plan or a payment plan for you. So you always want to communicate what is going on in your life with your creditors. Okay. Next. Okay. So you, and like we mentioned, this kind of just goes into further detail of your credit score, right? But like I said, you always want to shoot for trying to get an excellent credit score. And how do you do that? Just always make your payments on time, as we've mentioned. And don't apply for too much credit in a short period of time and stay within that 30% utilization. Next, Alicia. Okay. So... Just a reminder, get and review your credit report at least once every 12 months to make sure the information is accurate. And a lot of times, if you set up credit monitoring or credit alerts, you'll get a notification if somebody or if your credit has been run. And that can be anything from, you know, a car loan, a mortgage loan, a credit card, a personal loan, boat loan, anything. So anytime your credit is run, you can sign up for alerts that can notify you. And a reason why that's such a good idea to, to set up is because it does further eliminate or it does decrease the options or the chances for fraud. And a lot of times you have to remember, some people can make an honest mistake. Now, everybody can apply for anything online. So let's say somebody does one quick you know, number that's just a transposition. They might have accidentally ran their credit under your credit or your, your social security number. So it's always good to make sure that you, you are on top of it and you do view your credit report. Next. All right. So what is a productive credit history? So productive credit history would be anything that shows positive credit payments. So that is, sorry, that is payment history, length of credit history, type of credit products, and inquiries. So all these can play into the productive credit history. So you always want to make sure that you stay on top of it and you're always making your payments on time. Okay, again. One thing I do recommend for you all to do after this call is go to annualcreditreport.com. So this is an official website to get these free credit reports. You can also go to the, the credit reporting bureaus directly, which is Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion, or you can go to annualcreditreport.com. One thing I do want to mention is there's going to be a ton of third-party third parties out there that do do credit reporting or do do credit monitoring, but they can sometimes be a scam and you don't want to give your information out to everybody. So it's best to just go to annualcreditreport.com or directly to one of the credit bureaus. 
So going back to what, what I was talking about, watching out for imposters, right? It goes back to fraud. And fraud is so rampant now. And I do want to mention that. So always just keep track of what is being reported to your credit report. And keep in mind, so these other third parties, they're, they might say they're free, which they can be free for the first 30, 60, 90 days. But then after that, you're going to be charged. They all usually will require you to put in some sort of card number. So then they can charge you at the end of the free trial. And sometimes people don't read that little small writing. So it's just, I would just highly recommend you go directly to annualcreditreport.com. And again, so there's some other people that are, are okay with getting additional free credit reports. And if you receive public assistance, if you're unemployed looking for a job, if you're a victim of identity theft or financial fraud, and keep in mind, state law does provide for a free credit report. And another thing, like we mentioned before, if you were denied credit or a, an apartment lease, or if you were denied a job due to your credit, all of these different reasons are valid for getting a free credit report. And that's a good time for you to just analyze it, go through it, see what's on it, and see why your credit score is the way it is. Next. Okay, what sections are in credit reports? So we kind of talked about this earlier, but any accounts that you've sold, so what, what does that mean? I'll kind of explain that to you. So accounts that are sold, this commonly happens with a mortgage. So let's say you go ahead and you apply for a mortgage at Citibank, okay? And then we say, okay, we're gonna go ahead and sell, send your loan to a loan service provider, such as Sunlar, they're a big one. Also, Mr. Cooper, they're another big mortgage loan service provider. So you'll see that on your credit report. It'll show that you first had a mortgage with XYZ Bank, and then it'll show closed, and then it'll show open again, which will show under the new lender or the service provider. So you will see that on your credit. Another thing that we did mention earlier, public records, right? If you are if you owe back taxes or if you owe back child support, all that is included in your credit report. And, and keep in mind, let's say you want to apply for a job or a new apartment, they will be able to see all that, right? And so that's why I say it's so important. Just keep your credit really strong and keep reminding yourself to make your payments on time. And then if the personal and identifying information, we had mentioned it before, but it's everything ranging from your name, your social security, any aliases that you have been known as. For example, if you've known as Catherine, but you go by Kathy, you'll see both aliases on your credit report. Or if you hyphenate your last name, you will also see that on your credit report. And your date of birth is also on your credit report and any inquiries. So anytime you apply for a credit product, those inquiries will show up on your credit report. So you can always get your credit scores from some nonprofit organizations, they'll help you with it. If you're, if you're not sure how to do it, they'll help you. There's resources out there. And I want to really stress that. There are so many resources. I mean, just this great you know presentation that we're doing. It's a great thing that we can provide, right? Also your credit card statements or websites, that'll have your credit score on it. Also www.myfico.com, that'll definitely be on there. And you can check your Vantage score at vantagescore.com. And then not to forget to mention the three credit reporting agencies, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. They all can provide you your credit score. And just a reminder, you are always allotted one free credit report a year. So one last takeaway that I, I can't drill it into you guys even more, make sure to review and receive your credit report at least once every 12 months, just to make sure the information is accurate. 
And hey, you might be proud of yourself and say, hey, I'm doing great on my credit. I want to see my great payment history. It's, it's, it's definitely something to be proud of because I can tell you credit is not easy, right? It seems like it's easy, but it's really not. It can, it can really deteriorate fairly quickly. So you want to make sure that you're always staying on top of it. Next. Okay. I know we mentioned this earlier, but disputing errors in your credit report, right? It goes back to what we were talking about earlier. It's so important that you review your credit reports because that's the only way you'll know that if there are any errors in your credit reports. And just a reminder that you want to make sure that you do keep this in writing, whether it's online or you write a letter. Next, Alicia. If you find errors on your credit reports, you want to make sure to file a dispute right away. And I had mentioned this before. You want to make sure that you keep the records and you follow up because your credit is everything, guys. So if you do see some sort of error, if you and one thing I do want to mention is if you have, let's say, a junior or a senior in your family member that has the same name as you, really be careful and cautious about this because I've seen it where you have, you know, two people with the same name, John Smith Jr., John Smith Sr., or John Smith III. The name is exactly the same. So sometimes you might have misinformation on your credit, at which point you'll need to submit information to the credit bureaus proving you are who you are, not the senior or the junior for that matter. And a few things that you might see as our first error, error on your credit reports. Identity errors, that's just going back to what I was talking about just now. Incorrect reporting of account status. Let's say they'll say, hey, we closed this account, but the account's still open and active. Or you might see a balance error or outdated information. So you wanna always make sure, the only way to know this is if you're actually reviewing your credit once a year. Next. Okay, time limit on negative information. So I know I mentioned this in the beginning, but some bankruptcies are an exception. So seven years is typically the general rule of thumb for how long things stay on your credit report, but some bankruptcies can stay on your credit for 10 years. Okay, so we want to try to avoid that. There's, there's no time limit for negative information when somebody applies for a job with a yearly salary of seventy five thousand or more, or if they're if they have more than, if they're applying for more than one hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of credit, or life insurance with a face value of one hundred fifty thousand or more. Next, so. Seven, the seven year reporting period, how does it work, right? Some might think, okay, I got this credit card six years ago. Is it gonna drop off in the seventh year? No. So what happens is the seven year reporting period starts 180 days after you stopped paying on the debt. What does that mean? So let's say I, I made a late payment and I'm, I'm late 30 days. So the 180 days, starts after the 30 days. So we'll see that on the next slide. Okay, so here's an example of how the seven year reporting works. So in this case, you have August, 2018. Let's say I made a late payment on my credit card for 30 days. My delinquency started in August, but keep in mind, we have to factor in that 180 days, right? So that's why you see that at the bottom where it shows July 2018 plus 180 days. So technically your reporting will start in January of 2019 and it'll stay on for seven years. So that delinquency that I got back in August 2018 will stay on my account and my credit report till January 2026. It's a long time, guys. So I always want to stress make sure to always pay at least the minimum payment owed. Next. Okay, a few things that generally are not on your credit. Medical debt, it usually does not show up on your credit report until you haven't paid for 180 days or more. And the reason why is because 
medical debt, unfortunately, is something that we all have may come across facing at some period of time. And it's something that you can't predict. You can't predict that, hey, I'm going to end up in the hospital because of some crazy accident. You can't predict that. So typically, me medical providers and hospitals will allow you to be on a payment plan and they'll work with you. They don't want to report negative information on your credit or bureau. They know that you, they want to help you and they want to be there to help you settle that debt. And the only way to do that is by calling them and having that open line of communication. And this way it allows, it allows you as well as the medical provider to resolve any billing disputes they may have or to make payment arrangements with you. And I mentioned this earlier, guys, how to dispute errors on your credit report, either online or by mail, but I can't stress enough, make sure you make a copy of any correspondence that you do send in when you have an, a credit report dispute. Okay, what to include in your dispute letters. So don't forget, you always want to put your complete name and address. You want to put a clear description of what happened and a request for correction or removal. Now, the best thing to do is always make make it clear. You always want to explain exactly what happened on and be very precise, be very clear. Make sure you put dates, make sure you put dollar figures and make sure you put an explanation. Because keep in mind, when you're mailing something in, you're not having a conversation like you and I are having. It's somebody that's opening that letter. They're reading it. They're going through it. And that's what they're that's what they're pretty much making their decision on. So you want to make sure that you're clear and precise on any communication you have with the credit disputes. Excuse me. Okay. And you always want to make sure that you keep an image of the check or a screenshot of the payment history. And you always want to make sure that you keep receipts and that's where you always want to keep your, like a copy of whatever you submit. All right. And then after you file a dispute, the credit reporting agency by law has to send you a letter back letting you know that, hey, I did receive your dispute and we're working on it. And keep in mind that if you're requesting any notice of correction, may, or if it's on a business, make sure you put both the business name as well as any of the individuals that the credit report would be reporting on, okay? Next. Okay. Again, can't stress this enough, guys. You find an error in your credit report, make sure you file a dispute right away. Don't sleep on it because let little thing that next thing you know, seven years will go by and it'll fall off by itself. So you want to make sure that it doesn't impact you for that seven year period. You want to go ahead and take care of it immediately. Okay, and next slide. Okay. Just a reminder, your credit history does not have to be your future credit future. What that means is let's say right now you're having you're having a struggle with your finances and your credit isn't the strongest right now. Don't worry, you can fix your credit. There's different products out there that will help you do that. One way is doing a secured credit card where you put your money down and the bank will give you a credit card in return. Also, another way to do this is being a co-signer with somebody. If you know somebody like a parent or spouse who has really good credit, have them add you on as an authorized user or have them co-sign with you, which will help your credit improve. Next. Okay, repairing and improving credit. Make sure you get your credit reports. Make sure you pay all of your bills on time. Keep old accounts open if you can, because like we remembered, the history of your credit product, that does count towards 30% of your credit score. And always, always apply for credit only if you need it. And, you know, get paid back sometimes for, for purchasing, right? A lot of people get a credit card with rewards, so they can, can be paid back for any purchases that they're making. But always remember to pay back your payments on time.
Okay. And then I'll kind of pass this because we kind of talked about that a little bit earlier. And so again, a few ways to rebuild your credit, apply for a credit card at a store or gas station, become an authorized user or a co-signer for somebody else who has stronger credit. Um, and then also get a secured credit card. And this is offered pretty much at every financial institution out there. Okay. And just to kind of recap what we went through, because we're a little short on time, make sure you pay your bills on time. Make sure that you keep the pro pro proportion of the credit you use low compared to your credit limit. General rule of thumb again, 30% utilization is probably what you should be shooting for as far as a max, okay? Pay your taxes and child support on time as well. And if you see anything that isn't correct on your credit report, make sure that you dispute that immediately and make yeah. sure to get that credit report once a year for free. Okay, and here's some options of how to get help. Stop by your bank. We're always willing to help you. We want to talk to you. This is what we do on a daily basis, myself included. You guys can call me too if you want. I'll be more than happy to give you guys advice. Um, financial education nonprofit organization, just what we're doing right now, right? With LAEDC, that's what we're doing. We're, we're helping you. We're giving you guys advice and we're giving you some counseling services as well as some financial literacy information. And then... There are going to be some companies out there. I'm sure you've seen the commercials for credit repair and debt consolidation. So these companies are out there. They specialize in that and only that. But keep in mind what they're ultimately doing is they're just contacting the credit creditors on your behalf. They're, they're sitting there writing the letters so that you don't have to. So that's why they do charge a fee for these services. But keep in mind, you can do it by yourself so you don't have to pay them. Next. And then use caution. A lot of times you'll see a lot of commercials around debt consolidation, loans, um, payday loans, things of that nature. One thing I always want to stress is try to stay away from those because those usually have an average of 400% interest rate, which is a bit much. So we want to make sure that you guys are not doing that unless it's an absolute, absolute thing. And I know we're kind of short on time. So Alicia, Jose, do we want to just kind of leave some time for Q&A or do you want me to continue? No, yeah. If if we can uh, go to the Q&A, uh, first and foremost, thank you so much, Adea. Uh, you provided great information and thank you for everyone for staying over a bit. But I, I think I want to allow maybe three minutes uh, for some Q&A. There is some questions. I'll read them to you. Uh, first question today, uh, is there a certain reason why it's seven years? That's a very good question. Um, the only thing I can think of, it's it's lucky number seven. But <laughs> yeah, there isn't an actual reason why it's seven. It's been seven for a very long time, and they've kept it that way. And again, with the exception of bankruptcies, which is 10 years. Thank you. And then the next question by Elizabeth, what is the fastest way to raise your credit score? Um, she also mentioned that she saw that you pay twice within 15 days, separate it, and it will count as twice. So that's not, so a lot of people think that, and, and the way that really works is it's based on the days, right? So typically speaking, whenever you get a credit card statement or a billing statement in the mail, you're getting it mid-cycle, right? So if you're making one payment, it's going to show that you made that payment before the end of your billing cycle from the next statement that's going to come to you. So that's probably what you're, she was referring to. So a lot of people think, okay, if I make a payment now and I make a payment in 15 days, that's going to help. Well, it does because your utilization decreases. So even though in that billing cycle, you were paying only a part, part of it, in the end of that billing cycle, you're making another payment. So ultimately your utilization decreases before the end of that 30 days. No, that's great feedback. Uh, another question, this was from Diana. How may uh, your credit score decrease uh, for every inquiry? Ooh, so there's not a general 
point system of, okay, every inquiry will count this amount. It, it, there's no way, there, there's nothing like that out there. But they usually say on average, three credit inquiries a year is common. That's normal. That's not going to impact you negatively. Now, typically speaking, if you're if you have about five inquiries or more a year, that's when you might be questioned if you try to purchase a home loan or some other type of secured loan. They might ask you, well, why do you have so many inquiries in a short period of time? But it, that can also impact your credit. But like we saw before, as far as the inquiries, it only counts about 15 percent of your credit credit score. Awesome. Um, I, I want to thank you again. I want to thank City and, and Annabelle uh, for making this happen. I think it's a tool and a resource that's much needed. Uh, to all attendees, thank you for participating. Um, and I want to drop in the chat a, a one pager uh, that's very helpful tool. We will also follow up, Alicia, with a link to the recording uh, for those that were not able to attend, as well as with the page, the one pager. Uh, but I think there's one more question if you want to, if you have time today for the last question. Yeah. So uh, from Ricky, my credit score uh, keeps maintaining at 790 and I'm unable to make uh, 800. Is there a reason why? Ooh, so that there's no blanket statement to be able to answer that question. Um, the reason why, Ricky, I would need to know what's exactly on your credit. <laughs> so do you have mortgage? You have auto loans? Like what else is out there? But ultimately, if you're trying to in, like get it above that 800, I would highly recommend you pretty much lower your credit utilization or what you can do is make a small purchase every month on a credit card, pay it off at the end of the month, and within six months, you should be above that 800 score if that's the only thing that, you know, if everything kind of staying the same. But and I'm, again, I'm just kind of shooting blindly because I haven't looked at your credit report, but I would highly recommend check your utilization. And if you have credit cards that you're not utilizing, but they're still showing up on your credit report, what you can do is make a small purchase, pay it off, and that'll see, you'll see an increase in your credit as well. Awesome. Once again, I truly appreciate um, your time here, all the great feedback and insight. Um, Annabelle as well. Thank you. Thank you, City um, Bank. I want to kick it back to Alicia for, for any uh, last remarks. Of course. Thanks, Jose. Thank you again for joining. Um, I will be sending along the one pager uh, with the link to the YouTube recording of that for folks that want to be on that. Um, I will see who the who attended and will be able to send those resources as well. So yeah, thank you so much for joining and hope everybody has a good evening.